my pleasure to, uh, to have Professor John Conrad with us, and I think that John has the distinction of being the fittest economist I know. I see him at the gym at every lunch hour, uh, exercising and working at it. He has explained to me today how he had a very exciting trip here, and I was going to embellish and talk about dog sleds and everything, but apparently he even figured out to make sure that he would be here today, how he was going to get in. He can't get out of his street that he lives on is completely snow drifted in even now and so it's really remarkable he's here and we appreciate all the efforts he's gone to. Um, professor Conrad is a professor in resource economics at the Dyson School of Applied Economics. He did his PhD in economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison so that makes him a badger and um, so his area of expertise is dynamic optimization, resource and environmental economics, and resource economics. And he's a member of the Graduate Fields of Applied Economics and Management, Economics and Regional Science. And he's going to talk to us today about a really exciting application for economics theory um, in relation to wildlife conservation. And his wife, Janice, is here, which I was very excited to know. And so well, she had no choice <laughs> <laughs> because of the interesting travel arrangements. But with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Tom. <laughs> Before our, our uh, access road, which is about a half mile road to Silver Lake House, got snowed in, I did manage to get one car out to a neighbor's uh, uh, a driveway. And so if Janice wanted to come into campus today, she had no choice but to ride in with me uh, early in the morning and to go home with me. But she's put up with me for 48 years, so <laughs> I guess I can. <coughs> um, Thank you, Chris, uh, for the kind words. And um, today I want to talk about um, a, a fairly sort of specialized model uh, in economics that is concerned with the timing of when you make an investment or take some action, uh, when uh, that action has to cost, and the future net benefits are uncertain. And uh, so it's, it's kind of a model looking at uh, optimal timing, which uh, frequently is defined by a threshold, uh, so that you don't do anything until whatever is stochastically evolving hits the threshold. Or maybe you have a separating barrier in, in state space, and you don't do anything until maybe uh, two uh, stochastic processes are co-evolving until they hit that separating barrier. Um, feeling that uh, a, a, a seminar should be informative, uh, entertaining as well as informative, I'm going to start off with some uh, slides of some high profile endangered species. And also, this brings out some of the conservation interventions uh, that have been uh, used to try to bring back those species from the brink of extinction and to perhaps even uh, be able to reintroduce them into the wild as self-sustaining populations. So some of these high-profile species would include uh, Kirkman's warbler. Um, uh, this uh, is one of many uh, warbler species that uh, are high-profile and uh, charismatic. Uh, uh, Kirkman's warbler uh, has a, a breeding area in Michigan and now it's sort of expanded to Wisconsin and southern Ontario. Uh, from a population of uh, less than 500 individuals in 1972, by managing the landscape, in particular thinning and actually doing some controlled burning of a jack pine forest, they uh, can create uh, a habitat uh, that uh, will, has allowed the birds to increase in number to a current estimate of about 5,000. Uh, so that would be sort of the conservation intervention. When do you start modifying and hopefully improving uh, habitat? Um, the whooping crane, again, a, a, a high profile species. Um, the uh, Western population um, uh, was estimated to uh, have been down to, I think, uh, uh, 15 adults in 1935. Um, uh, the breeding grounds um, are in the Wood Buffalo Park um, in uh, Alberta, I believe. And then uh, the cranes migrate down to uh, uh, Texas. And by providing greater protection 
um, and to uh, improve uh, habitat, I think, in both the breeding grounds and overwintering grounds, the population is up to uh, uh, 382. Uh, but wait, it even gets kind of more involved than that. They had a captive breeding program and went through a fairly extensive uh, uh, attempt to uh, get uh, the uh, captive whoopers to uh, form a second migratory stock uh, with breeding grounds in Wisconsin and overwintering grounds in Florida. And here's a little uh, video from National Geographic that hopefully you'll find entertaining. Our training starts when the uh, chick is still in the egg, but as soon as they punch a hole, they start communicating with the parent. They use what's called a brood call. So we play a recording of that brood call to them, and we also play a sound of our engine noise, trying to get used to that whole sound. Once hatched, imprinting continues, but in stealth mode. These birds are isolation reared, so anybody who goes near the birds any time has to wear a big baggy costume. They have to carry a puppet. It kind of looks like a whooping crane, but our real motivation is to actually uh, disguise the human form. Two weeks in, and the young whoopers will follow their puppet mother anywhere. In this case, inches from the spinning prop of an aircraft. He's used to the aircraft, used to the noise. And they're running and they're, they're holding their little wings out. You know, they have no idea what those wings are for, but they're holding them out because instinct tells them to do it. Must be a, such a revelation for them, you know? <laughs> they had an epiphany and all of a sudden they got off the ground. It must be incredible. By the time autumn blows in, the four and a half month old puppet reared whooping cranes are almost full grown. Their wings, close to seven feet wide and strong enough to reach speeds of 45 miles per hour, will take them on their first 1,200 mile migration from Wisconsin to Florida's Panhandle. Wild birds could probably do it in anywhere from three to seven days, but with the ultralights, it takes them sometimes up to 60 something days. But it's not the limitation of the birds, it's the limitation of the ultralights on how far they can fly each day. And there's no limitation to the joy the whoopers bring to the rabid craniacs on this cool December morning. The weather's good, the winds are low, and the birds are coming. The exact date they land is always up in the air. But it's a safe bet that they'll be landing mid-December. I've had two special days in my life. The first day was when I got married, and the second was seeing those young whooping cranes come into St. Mark's. And it just brings tears to my eyes. It's amazing. There is just something about these birds that, you know, goes right to the heart. Come spring, these whoopers will get the itch to return to Wisconsin. They'll just take off. There's no bags to pack. There's no goodbyes. And there's no mother ultralight. They're on their own to make it back and to teach their future brood. If we're lucky, they come right back to where we introduce them. That's what you call success. One of the uh, unfortunate things with uh, the captive breeding and puppet raised whooping cranes was that apparently they weren't exceptionally good parents. That uh, the survival rate for the chicks that they had wasn't too great. And I think I heard a, a NPR uh, last fall that they were actually going to discontinue um, that. But. Um, again, trying to point out uh, what some of the uh, conservation interventions might be and the uh, extent to which uh, people are willing to fork over money to support uh, conservation uh, uh, interventions. Uh, the red wolf is an interesting species. Um, uh, they had difficulty finding pure genetically pure uh, red wolf, uh, which at, uh, at the time of colonization was fairly widespread uh, uh, across the eastern US. US. Um, and they did set up a captive breeding program. They reintroduced uh, some adults and pups uh, to uh, the Alligator National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. 
And they've gone so far as to uh, actually inoculate uh, uh, pups for distemper, parvo virus, rabies, in an attempt to increase the uh, survivability there. Uh, again, they've had some difficulty, I think, building up the wild population. In 2007, there was apparently 93 individuals in North Carolina, uh, but by uh, 2014, only 50 to 65. Part of the problem is also inter, uh, interbreeding with coyotes. And uh, uh, then the question is, is do you have a red wolf or do you have a, a coyote uh, red wolf or something? Uh, gray wolf, um, uh, a much more successful story. 66 wolves from Alberta were released into Yellowstone National Park and Central Idaho. The Western population is now at about 1,800 uh, individuals. And the Great Lakes, which they didn't do any uh, uh, <coughs> additional uh, conservation interventions, that population is now estimated at 3,600. And uh, some of the people in Minnesota are calling for a wolf season and to uh, bring it under control uh, because of the uh, numerous pets that are lost to the wolves and uh, uh, some people have felt actually threatened uh, when they've encountered uh, the gray wolf. Uh, the Florida panther, um, uh, again, um, uh, uh, the population uh, probably was down at about 20 individuals um, uh, before 1995. Uh, many, uh, the, the area where uh, you can find them is now towards the Florida Everglades, and uh, the main source of mortality is highway uh, fatality when these animals are hit by cars on the Tamiami Highway. Uh, 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 they were also exhibiting signs of uh, inbreeding, um, and so in 1995, uh, eight female pumas uh, uh, that they think were genetically pretty close were released into southern Florida uh, to increase genetic diversity, and the estimate now is 100 to 180 uh, panthers. Uh, Red-cacated woodpecker, uh, widespread in the southeastern uh, United States. It's a cooperative breeder, so there's a breeding pair. And uh, fledgling, fledglings from earlier uh, uh, breeding oftentimes serve as helpers. And um, to increase the population <coughs> number, they've um, actually uh, increased the number of cavity boxes. Uh, normally, the birds would require sort of old growth pine uh, uh, of at least 18 inches in diameter in order to make a suitable cavity, which takes them a while. Um, one of the conservation interventions has been to build artificial cavities, and then also translocation to increase uh, genetic variability. Uh, the North Atlantic right whale, with a connection to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Population was perhaps as low as uh, 100 or less individuals in 1935. Uh, the right whale was called the right whale because it was the best whale to uh, hunt if you were in colonial uh, America. They migrated close to shore. Uh, when they were killed, uh, they didn't swim all that fast. When they were killed, they would float, and so they were the right whale to go after. Um, uh, now, the current estimate is about 524 individuals, and here's a video talking about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. The North Atlantic right whale, at 55 feet and up to 70 tons, it's one of the largest animals in the ocean. With fewer than 400 remaining in the world, it's also among the most endangered. Right whales spend much of the year feeding in the rich waters off New England and Canada, just a few miles from major cities. Dinner every day is some two million calories of plankton, and right whales spend hours catching it. Long, gray fringes of baleen hang from the jaw, straining millions of tiny plankton into a cavernous mouth as the whale swims slowly through the murky water. Abundant, tiny food clouds these northern waters, 
making North Atlantic right whales extremely hard to film underwater. In the relatively clear water of the southern hemisphere, this southern right whale, a closely related species, offers a better view of a whale's calm grace beneath the surface. Adults spend much of their time on their own or traveling with a calf, but they sometimes gather by the dozens to bask, blow, splash, and flirt for hours at a time, seemingly oblivious to their surroundings. North Atlantic right whales live along the busy Atlantic seaboard where they're constantly in the path of shipping vessels. A 70-ton whale is no match for commercial ships that can weigh more than 90,000 tons. Collisions are usually deadly. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology is part of a coalition working to warn ship captains about whales in their path. With our partners, perhaps we can keep these majestic animals from disappearing. So, um, again, my understanding is that they've got um, uh, listening buoys, um, but they're picking up uh, calls by uh, what could be a humpback whale, or a minke whale, or a right whale, and to actually determine, uh, they use some, uh, I think, machine learning uh, to uh, determine whether uh, the species that they're listening to, and if it's a right whale, then a message goes out to the Coast Guard and uh, uh, ships uh, entering Boston or New York, they have to slow down and put an observer on the bow to, to look for them. Um, the model that we're going to talk about today uh, uh, is an attempt to take a look at um, the, uh, the timing of the conservation intervention for the California condor. And um, uh, in 1987, the 22 remaining wild condors were captured and placed in a captive breeding program at the Los Angeles and San Diego zoos. Uh, they were reintroduced at various sites from 1991 to date, uh, and in 2015, uh, 167 uh, California condors uh, in captivity, uh, excuse me, yeah, in captivity in 268 in, uh, in the wild. Here's a, a little time series uh, of uh, the estimated population numbers in terms of number of condors from uh, 1965 to 1980, we see this downward trend, but sort of stochastic as well. There are some periods where we have ups as well as downs. Um, and here's a much more optimistic uh, time series uh, from 2002 to 2014 um, as a result of the captive uh, breeding program and uh, they would be, uh, 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 in many instances, I think, providing lead-free carrion for which the condors might feed on, and they also would check to make sure the chicks weren't being fed uh, what's called micro-trash, which uh, they would then have to remove uh, uh, and to prevent uh, fatality to the chicks. Okay, so what's the theory uh, or the models from finance and economics that might be relevant to the timing of a conservation intervention. Uh, real option theory is concerned with the optimal timing of investments or actions where future net benefit is uncertain and where the investment or action is costly to reverse. Uh, perhaps a classic example might be building a hydroelectric dam uh, when the future price of electricity is uncertain or stochastic, and when removing that dam would be costly. Um, real option theory can be applied to the optimal timing of a conservation intervention to prevent the extinction of an endangered species, or hopefully prevent the ex extinction of an endangered species. When that intervention is costly and population dynamics of the species post-intervention is also uncertain. 
Uh, so here's a, a, a real option model for the optimal timing of a conservation intervention. Um, we're going to see that stochastic dynamic programming, in this case in continuous time, um, uh, with uh, a Bellman equation that results uh, post Ito's lemma uh, is a critical part of, of the model formulation. Um, let's suppose that uh, cap n equaling n of t is the actual size of an endangered population. And we'll let little x, uh, x of t, equal the natural law of cap n. Um, extinction of an endangered species is often caused by a series of stochastic shocks. Uh, for example, ship strikes uh, uh, for, again, uh, to right whales. Uh, geometric Brownian motion has been shown to be a reasonable model of population size, particularly when the population is, is far below any carrying capacity and there's no compensatory uh, 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 reduction in the relative growth rate. Um, what might that model of geometric Brownian motion look like? Well, it's a stochastic process where the change in the population dn is equal to r, an intrinsic growth rate, times the population size over the increment of time dt. Uh, but there's uh, a stochastic uh, term um, given by the uh, term sigma n times dz. <coughs> dz is uh, uh, an increment of a Wiener process or a random walk. Uh, and it's equal to uh, epsilon of t, square root of dt. Um, and epsilon is a standard normal uh, random variant. Um, using um, the Edo stochastic calculus, um, we can actually get the corresponding equation for dx. Um, and uh, that has a drift rate, then that's equal to r, the intrinsic growth rate for the number of individuals, minus uh, one half the variance uh, uh, from uh, the geometric grounding motion, and then an, uh, a noise term sigma dz. So, so r is negative, right? Pardon me? R is negative. <coughs> r, 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 r would probably be negative. So we kind of assume it goes down, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the fact that we have some variance is even sure. making the effective drift rate for the sure. law uh, uh, even smaller. Um, <clears throat> with geometric Brownian motion, n uh, will be normal, uh, log normally distributed. Um, <clears throat> and um, x will be normally distributed. The expected value uh, of xt, t out into the future, would be equal to whatever the uh, uh, initial x value is, x0, plus uh, that uh, uh, term mu times t, where mu is equal to r minus sigma squared over 2. And there's a variance equal to sigma squared t. Um, and that's sort of a, uh, an intuitive feature. The further that you look out into the future, the greater the potential variation and the greater the range uh, for uh, x, excuse me, would be. So, so, I'm sorry, I'm trying to square it off with the evolution equation on the previous slide. So here you're saying that n of t is log normally uh, distributed. You mean yeah. for every time slice t? Yeah, right? at time slice t. And so you're, you're dragging it with using the drift term, the, the expectation. Uh, I see. Okay. It just might be true. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, if the intrinsic growth rate r is less than zero, um, extinction would occur when n is equal to one, or equivalently when the uh, value for x is zero. Uh, extinction will occur with probability one with a negative uh, <coughs> intrinsic growth rate. It's only a question of when. Um, the graph on the next slide shows just three realizations uh, from uh, uh, the, the uh, stochastic process where 
R is equal to minus 0 0.16.85, and uh, sigma is 0 0.34627. Um, <clears throat> we, we started the uh, stochastic processes from an initial uh, condition of n equals 50 uh, condors, and um, you can see that um, here, um, uh, these three realizations, the light green one drops down fairly quickly, even though there was some earlier on, some upswings up to uh, 80 uh, condors, uh, but um, uh, they ultimately decline. And the blue one, you've got again some uh, interval of time where the population is doing fairly well, but then declines. But with a negative intrinsic growth rate, um, uh, they ultimately uh, will all head to n equal to 1. <clears throat> Without intervention, based on parameter values for mu sigma and n equals 50, the mean time, one of the extinction diagnostics that you can get from this model, is the mean time to extinction. Um, and that would have been 50 years. The modal time um, is often a, a more preferred extinction diagnostic. Um, at 28.87, basically the distribution of arrival times to extinction um, has a fat um, red tail. Uh, based on the population data for 2002 to 2014, um, the R value is estimated at 0 0.9. Uh, sigma is also reduced, so that that has uh, made a considerable improvement over the negative value for R and the higher value of sigma based on that earlier time series from uh, 1965 to 1980. Um, so the intervention, captive breeding, uh, monitored reintroduction programs, resulted in a positive intrinsic growth rate and a smaller standard deviation rate. If, and it's a big if, if we had known the post-intervention values for R and sigma, should we have waited until the wild California condor population had declined to 22 individuals in 1987? So that's really the, the question I'd like to address using this real options model. But it does require that you either would know how effective the conservation intervention will be, uh, or you have some guess as to what it would do to improve or increase R and perhaps reduce uh, sigma. Uh, however, we, we need I'm an economist, unfortunately, <laughs> and we need some economics to add to simply uh, estimates of R and sigma from the time series data. To determine the optimal time to intervene using real options theory, we need some additional economic information. Specifically, one, the regret or social loss if the California condor were to go extinct. Two, the fixed and variable costs of the uh, proposed conservation intervention, and three, the anxiety caused by population levels nearing extinction, and four, the social rate of discount. <coughs> One of the areas of uh, environmental economics has been to try to value environmental public goods through a technique called contingent valuation, um, which is basically a stated preference survey, and they try to determine willingness to pay oftentimes at a household level, um, and then try to figure out what the appropriate population is to get an aggregate uh, willingness to pay. Here I'm taking a little bit different tack, although it would probably still use a contingent valuation survey. What I'd like to know is what, uh, maybe on a household level or individual level, um, the loss to society uh, if the California condor had gone extinct. Um, let's let little f be the fixed cost of starting 
captive breeding program. Let's let a little V be the variable cost of the constitutional intervention, the, the annual yearly budget to, con, to carry out the program. Uh, delta, uh, greater than zero, is our social rate of time preference. There's very vast literature on that, but uh, basically uh, what we're looking at is sort of society's uh, risk-free rate of time preference in terms of how much uh, uh, a dollar tomorrow would be worth today. Estimates by Martin Weitzman, a very well-regarded economist, uh, came out with a value of Delta of about 2%, 0 0.02. Okay, so we'll use that when we get to the numerical analysis. My uh, definition of regret is that regret is a flow loss was sort of a one-time loss. And so uh, I want to take whatever that estimate for cap L would be, multiply it by the discount rate to get sort of the flow of regret uh, if the condor goes extinct. And um, uh, then um, we're going to define uh, anxiety, the first time you've seen anxiety being defined mathematically, as being equal to that uh, flow of regret if extinction occurs, but then uh, it would, uh, while the population is still alive, <coughs> it would be multiplied by uh, e to the minus gamma x gamma the positive, and the flow of anxiety would uh, look like this when r and gamma are 1. Uh, so that as x goes to zero, anxiety goes to uh, regret. And for uh, high values of the log of x, uh, high values of x, the log of n, um, anxiety might be fairly low. But then when we get down to uh, lower uh, log uh, values for uh, n, uh, anxiety starts to decrease. Um, let's suppose that R0 uh, negative and sigma 0 positive and mu 0 equaling R0 minus sigma squared over 2 uh, are parameters prior to the conservation intervention. Then let's suppose we know or have some uh, uh, prediction that R1 will be positive, sigma 1 uh, greater than 0, and we get a new mu 1 equaling R1 minus sigma 1 square root of 2. Then um, the continuous time stochastic dynamic programming involves a Bellman equation post Edo's lemma that takes the following form. Basically, uh, we're looking at the expected discounted cost or loss um, from uh, a population uh, of size log uh, equaling x. And uh, this is a regret or an anxiety flow. And then here are two uh, terms coming from uh, Ito's lemma. And the Bellman equation becomes um, a second order uh, differential equation in the unknown function v0 of x. Um, the solution um, to that equation takes this form, v0x equaling uh, uh, a0 times uh, e to the minus gamma x, where a0 uh, has to take this form in order to satisfy Um, after exercising the option to intervene, incurring fixed cost, f greater than zero, the value function representing discounted expected anxiety and the variable cost of the intervention uh, takes a different form, value function uh, delta times v1, v1 is the value function. Here we still have uh, anxiety, but we have our variable cost of operating the program. We've incurred the fixed cost already, but it'll come back in when, our, when we look at the optimal timing 
uh, question. And then, again, Prometo's lemma, uh, terms involving the first derivative of the V1 and the second derivative. And um, the form that we uh, had before with the additional term V divided by delta will have derivatives that satisfy this equation. So um, it will be optimal to intervene when the endangered species has declined to a level, call it x equals x star, where um, a function g of x um, with those constant terms a1 minus a0 times e to the minus gamma x plus v divided by delta, that's sort of the present value of the variable cost of the program, plus the fixed cost equals zero. So um, what we're looking for would be uh, uh, the, the, the sort of the second order conditions are inequalities here. Um, g of x has to be less than zero when x is less than x star, and g of x has to be greater than zero for x greater than uh, x star. And we're looking for a single crossing in the uh, g of x function. But it turns out we can actually get an analytic solution and that the critical barrier when the population declines to it, x star is actually given by uh, this uh, equation. For it to make sense, we need to have a0 minus a1 being greater than 0. And a sufficient condition for that um, is given here. Um, it can be shown that um, f, r, and v are actually, that x star is invariant proportional changes in f, r, and v. And that might be somewhat useful if, if we wanted to sort of normalize uh, regret to one and then express the fixed cost of the conservation intervention and the variable cost as some brass fraction of r. But we've got some uh, the critical population level, then, that triggers conservation would be n star equaling uh, e raised to the exponent x star. What are the values for x star and n star based on parameter values for the California condor captive breeding program? So uh, just to make sure I keep up. So V1 is the expected total cost, uh, including the regret, once you kick in the conservation. Uh, v0 is if you don't, and you, you essentially have a free boundary problem where you are finding the, right, it's an obstacle problem, right. you can find one of them without, it's not coupled, yes. and then you are figuring out uh, the equation for v0, new equation for v0 based on the switching point. Uh, I got this part. What I don't get is the boundary conditions which you imposed on uh, v0 and v1, uh, in each one of those modes. So um, <coughs> what determines V0 of 0 and V1 of 0? Right. Um, uh, basically, we need to find a functional form that has derivatives that will satisfy that Bellman equation. Is, so is that what you're asking? And this, this form does satisfy it. Um, the question is, when we get estimates for R0, sigma 0, uh, R1, sigma 1, and estimates for uh, regret, cap R, uh, the fixed cost of the program, little f, the variable cost, little v. Um, will we have, in order for x star to be positive, we have to have a0 minus a1. I understand positive. this part, but even for, let's talk v0. Suppose I'm not allowed to do the interve intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, what determines v0 of 0? Then, in that case, um, uh, it's going to ultimately go to L. L. Well, uh, to L. yeah, it, will, it should go to, when the species X goes extinct, mm -hmm. little x is zero, then society has incurred that loss, cap L. So that would be a boundary. And for V1? And for V1, 
um, if the program is wildly successful and the log of n x gets very, very large, uh, regret has gone down to zero, then I think the, the lower bound uh, there on society's cost, let's see, well it actually might be uh, V over delta. Because if you have to continue the program, you're incurring that variable cost V every year or every instant, and uh, then the lower bound there would be V over delta. I hadn't thought about what the bounds were, but that's a good question. Thank you. Sorry to, to yeah, no, that's OK. No. Uh, this, this paper is still in the process, of, so the comments are helpful. So here um, are some parameter values that we um, uh, encountered in terms of the mu0, uh, sigma0 squared, mu1, sigma 1 squared. Um, the R um, is a, a value where um, <clears throat> there are approximately, let's see, where do I say this? Next slide, I think. Okay. <clears throat> there are approximately 116 million households in the United States. Um, if each household were willing to make a one time payment of $2 to prevent the extinction of the California condor, then L, that societal loss, is $232 million, and the regret equal to delta 0 0.02 times that $232 million would be $4,640,000. Uh, so let's run with that. Um, uh, gamma, I actually finagled gamma around a little bit to, um, again, satisfy uh, the conditions uh, for uh, A0 uh, zero being greater than uh, A1. Um, I don't have a, a basis for that. Uh, F, the fixed cost, um, 5 million to sort of start the captive breeding program in uh, Los Angeles and San Diego zoos, that might be a little bit high. The one value that we do have some data on is the variable cost, which uh, is running at about 1.2 million uh, from uh, 2007 to 2011. The uh, social rate of discount or the social rate of time preference uh, has been estimated to be uh, around 2%, and uh, Martin Weitzman has an interesting paper back in the uh, American Economic Review in 2001 called Gamma Discounting, uh, if you want to find more about uh, social rate of discount. So, um, where does that leave us? Well, we go back to that equation for X star, and we get um, a value of X star <coughs> 4.9301, and that would imply a condor population of 138 individuals, which um, uh, would have uh, triggered the captive breeding program at a higher number of condors than the 22 that were rounded up in 1987. Well, conclusions and caveats. Uh, changes in the abundance of an endangered species can be significantly affected by stochastic shocks. Uh, geometric Brownian motion has been shown to be um, a reasonable model for population dynamics of an endangered species. And I've got some references to some of the literature in ecology uh, for that. In economics, the theory of real options is concerned with uh, the timing of investments that are risky and costly to reverse. Uh, the theory will typically identify a critical threshold when the costly investment or action should be uh, undertaken. Actions to prevent or delay the extinction of an endangered species include, and this is going back to our earlier slides and discussions, captive breeding programs, translocation um, 
improving, restoring habitat, wildlife corridors, uh, parks and preserves, uh, preventing poaching, uh, regulation and prohibition of toxics that may well be uh, poisoning the environment for uh, <coughs> endangered species. The difficulty in applying real option theory to endangered species conservation is one, knowing what the social loss or regret would be if a species goes extinct. And there, again, maybe if you're uh, willing to believe the contingent valuation that you can get uh, uh, a truthful answer from a hypothetical question, um, uh, that might be a vehicle to come up with an estimate for social loss or regret. The fixed and variable costs of conservation interventions also need to be known, and the effectiveness of the intervention in increasing R and sigma. And of course, that's uh, fairly difficult. Uh, uh, we've had now fairly uh, extensive history of conservation interventions, perhaps uh, some sort of meta study of those uh, programs might give us some ideas as to um, for what types of species <coughs> different types of conservation interventions might be uh, effective. So that's uh, my spiel for today. Thank you for listening and uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. Steve. Okay. So this, this is um, <clears throat> fairly naive. So we never, we do never know the parameter values. So what, what does that do? Does so suppose I have say some uncertainty distribution on every single one of the parameters. Do I just apply the theory as if I knew the parameters, and then take all those policies and calculate them across my uncertainty distribution? Or does the fact that I'm uncertain change the, the strategy? I think the fact that you're uncertain puts us in what is sometimes called the precautionary principle, uh, where, where you don't know, um, you know, you know whether the system dynamics is going to, stochastic dynamics are going to change. And um, therefore, you might take action sooner rather than later <coughs> in higher populations. The other thing, you know, might be to uh, uh, run the analysis, get X stars for a whole bunch of different combinations of parameters, and then maybe try to assign some overall probability that that parameter set is, is perhaps the, the relevant okay. one. Okay, so. Is there some way of doing the analysis where you don't say sigma is this, but you say I have this distribution of possible sigma values and coming out with the threshold <coughs> that takes your uncertainty yeah, you into know, account? That's a good question because I think where that's leading us is it's leading us to a multi-stochastic state variable problem. So now not only uh, 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 is the population of California Condor is evolving stochastically, but some parameters in the system are also maybe evolving stochastically, and that creates a much more difficult, a much more complex Feldman equation to, to try to solve. Um, and you're going to then have, you know, a multi-dimensional partial differential equation. Okay. Yeah. So it it seems you know one of the things you showed really terrified me, and that was the amount of variability in those three different Monte Carlo simulations, yeah. right? And uh, one of them seemed like it's not heading for the extinction yeah. anytime soon. The other one dropped to the extinction levels pretty much right away. Uh, that, that raises several related questions. The first one is whether or not that, that population size, whether the continuous models are, are actually predictive. Um, and maybe going to a discrete time. That's right, and discrete oh, yeah. number of, of uh, species. The second yeah. one is, you know, uh, given that fact, uh, is it really 
the best we can do to optimize the expected value. Because if, if the variance in your prediction is much larger than the current population size, that means that in a large number of simulations, you are going to, to, to sort of standard deviation. Yeah, you're going to. <laughs> so perhaps my question, the main question is, uh, have you considered minimizing the probability of extinction or instead of maximizing, sorry, minimizing the expected uh, regret cost, or alternatively using it as a constraint. So suppose I'm willing to tolerate the probability of extinction of at most 10%. Given that, how do I optimize the regret level? The right now, in this model, um, you know, if we get estimates of R and sigma, then if we don't do anything, you know, we pretty much know what's going to happen because we can uh, calculate uh, uh, the mean arrival time to extinction mm -hmm. and the modal time, and there's a, a PDF uh, for the distribution of arrival times. Um, so unless you, you know, have some way to, you know, minimize uh, that PDF without, you know, talking about conservation interventions and costly. I'm not quite sure how, how you would do that. Because right now, that prior distribution is sort of given. By so it could be that your quantile constraints are the things which are driving your intervention time. Uh, or it could be that the quantile constraints are inactive, and then you truly are in the world where you are uh, minimizing the expected cost. Okay. And that would depend on the parameter radius for R1, R0, the other thing that your second comment sort of would be like a chance yeah. constraint yeah, programming uh, exercise of some so you 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 know will not tolerate mm -hmm. an extinction uh, probability greater than such and such and so um, you know what's the, the the best we can do with that chance constraint right yeah you know. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that you know the whole discussion of uh, timing of conservation interventions, uh, conservation programs, would be open up to a whole broad spectrum of discrete time models and you know alternative models. This uh, appealed to me simply because um, this real option literature, um, you know, has looked at the timing <coughs> of investments, and it seems to me that it's sort of at least theoretically. Uh, appropriate for, for, for this kind of deliberation. Um, okay, so it's um, the, your conclusion that they waited too long by a factor of six. Yeah. Okay, now what this makes me think about is climate change. Okay, so um, right. You, you should do something when the temperature has only gone up by this much, but we're going to wait until it's, okay. So is there any, are there plausible parameters for your model under which people actually did make the optimal decision? Or is this, is your conclusion saying <coughs> that we're too dumb to do the right thing? Right now, and, and I don't have a, a lot of firm uh, you know, a numerical analysis to base that, but that's sort of the implication of that they, they maybe waited too long. Um, uh, then uh, the question is, if we had reduced our the regret to a lower level, then maybe waiting until the population declines to, to those 22 condors would have been optimal from the real option model perspective. Is there any reason to believe that R1, Sigma 1, and particularly V, your running cost, yeah. uh, your variable cost of intervention, should be independent of X? That's uh, an interesting question. Um, in particular, would the variable cost of operating the program depend on the number of birds right. you're dealing with. I think that's that's definitely plausible. And so, if you were to make v a function of x, right. <laughs> you need to tell me what the functional form is. You know, what are the parameters well, of that functional form? Maybe it would be proportional. 
or, or some mean But that would probably be a good way to start. Right. Yeah. Or, or, or fat. Actually, in like conjunction with that, what about the effectiveness? The effectiveness of the uh, intervention. That's R one. That's where that's captured, right? Yeah. That I would think would be uh, very much related to the population. Two X. Yeah. Two yeah. X. And then you well, sort of what, on it, what you're effect. getting back. You're getting back to a compensatory net growth function in some ways. If if R depends on X, then you're saying maybe implying a sort of a caring capacity, which is causing the relative rate of growth to so, <coughs> function of the size of the population. Or inbreeding. Okay, okay, if you yeah. wait until they're 20, then you have more right. problems with inbreeding, and your chance for recovery is going to, take, going to be lower. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, yeah. you know, there's this sort of rule of thumb that under 100, you're doomed. Yeah. Right? Which, uh, in many cases, turned out to be wrong, because you even showed us some examples of recovery from less than 100. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? But, yeah. Okay, well, so thank you for listening. Yeah. The, the last one, just as a comment rather than a question. The first part where you were showing the whooping cranes. Uh, in 2012, in Russia, uh, there was a great publicity stunt by Vladimir Putin. Where he was doing that thing with a type of Russian cranes, uh, with strachs. Uh, it ended badly. Uh, he got rejected as the leader of the pack. Uh, I think one of them survived the activity afterwards. So, yeah. In any case, you can find all kinds of amusing uh, uh, videos on YouTube if you do a search on Crane and Putin. One more thing to hang out on. <laughs>